the location. Hey everyone, it's me, John. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. And what we just heard there was the police band, except it was a civilian. What had happened was she found uh, an officer that was down and she went into his car and um, pulled the CB and tried to get some help for him. Uh, On last week's Brain Scratch, we talked about a case where it was an officer-involved shooting and we were really looking into the side of um, bad procedures and maybe sometimes bad people being in that job. So for today's case, I wanted to flip the script on that. I wanted to look at why maybe some of these officers have a very good cause for concern and outside of that, maybe highlight someone that is really good at this job instead. And that's why I really wanted to speak about and highlight this man, Officer Jason Ellis with the Bardstown Police Department in Kentucky. Uh, he was part of a canine unit with his dog, Figo, that uh, worked on trying to crack down on drug crime in the area. Um Unfortunately, once I started looking into this case, it just went into a whole different direction. And uh, quite honestly, I'm at a point right now where I I have to kind of stop chasing threads. There's just there's so much going on with this case that I just have to get this episode out. And I might do follow up episodes chasing some of those threads down. But uh, you'll see as we look into this case. It's strange because for a case that has so little in terms of physical evidence that we can talk about, the situation that's going on in Bardstown is pointing to something else entirely, and it's something um, that could be really, really bad for the community, and they're already responding in a way where they're they're basically asking for help. So um, I hope that highlighting this on YouTube here might be some form of helping them in that cause and raising some more attention to what's going on out here. Um, Before I get started on this episode, I also have to thank, I'm going to call him Brain Scratcher J, because I didn't quite get his approval to use his name and time, um, and I want to make sure to keep people anonymous if I don't have their approval. Um, But he let me know about this case and about some of the other details that are going on in this area. However, I had no idea what I was going to find once I actually started researching this for myself, but I want to thank him real quick for... Um, starting me on this case. So before we start uh, directly into the story of Jason Ellis, let's take a quick look at an article. This is from Time, uh, I guess what used to be Time Magazine, now time.com. This was posted on December 29th of 2016. The U.S. saw 135 police officers die in the line of duty in 2016, which is the highest number of fatalities on the job in five years. Nearly half of those who were killed while working this year were fatally shot, including 21 police officers who died in different ambush-style attacks carried out across the country, the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund said Thursday. Um... I didn't really have a number on it, so I I wanted to find this out. 135 officers, that is more than two officers per week that are killed in the line of duty. So in terms of the conversation we were having last week about officers that are maybe uh, responding too harsh or pulling their weapons too quickly, this this is some information I think that helps give some light to that type of mindset. Um, With that many officers dying, you've got at least two, close to two and a half happening in every state. Um, I'm sure the stories of these deaths gets around to the other departments very rapidly, and that might create a bit of this mindset where they they know that they're in a dangerous situation and they might have to act a certain way to get themselves out of that dangerous situation. Um, I'm not trying to backtrack on last week, and let me make that clear. I'm trying to understand the other side of this conversation and to get a little bit more into that mindset about why this kind of stuff happens. But this episode in particular, we're going to dive into one particular case about this ambush style of attack, um, and that is Jason Ellis's case. 
Uh, we're starting with an article from WCPO.com. Uh, there is a big write-up here that was done. It's done almost in a narrative format. It feels like a piece of fiction almost, but um, there is a disclaimer at the end of it that assures us all the facts in this case are very solid. Uh, I got to be honest with you guys, I kind of struggled when I was reading through this because it pushed a little too much into um, areas of the story that quite honestly factual or not, they really don't help us understand this case anymore. But what this does do is it brings us a very clear understanding of the humanity that is going on around this case of the last day of Jason's life, the things that he did, uh, some of the interactions he had with his family. This article is called Exit 34. Of course, it'll be in the links below uh, so you can read it for yourselves. But I wanted to start with just a little piece from it. Tucked halfway between Louisville and Lexington sits Bardstown, Kentucky's second oldest city. This town of 14,000 in the heart of bourbon country, named the most beautiful small town in America last year by Rand McNally, is a community that knows its residents, listens to its elders, and respects its lawmen. It also holds a secret. Someone, somewhere, knows something about what happened on May 25th as Bardstown police officer Jason Ellis, a Batavia native and former Cincinnati Reds minor league player, turned from Bluegrass Parkway onto Exit 34 toward home after signing off for the night. We're going to continue the story uh, with a write-up about this case at swordandscale.com. Um, who, in terms of giving us the details, this is a bit of a more concise retelling of the details of this case. Jason Ellis, 33, was a seven-year veteran of the Bardstown, Kentucky Police Force and decorated canine narcotics officer. In 2007, he was commended for his brave actions on duty, and in 2008, Jason was recognized as Officer of the Year in his department. His death remains one of the few unsolved murders nationwide in which an officer was the victim. And we've actually spoken about that um, before on the channel. When it comes to uh, deaths involved or murders, particularly involving officers, those cases are solved. It's it's a ridiculously high number. I think it's like 95 or 96 percent of the time. So uh, here we're talking about a case that is, um, you know, four years old and it still has not been solved. And it is involving an officer death. Pretty rare uh, for this type of instance to occur. His shift began on May 24th, 2013, and seemed fairly ordinary. The only noticeable difference was the absence of his trusted partner, Figo, his canine companion officer, as their assigned patrol car was in the shop for repairs. Um, according to the other article, uh, Exit 34, his car was actually being repainted, but for one reason or another, he didn't have his canine vehicle, so he was using a different police vehicle, and he did not have his canine partner with him. Officer Ellis signed off with his badge number around 2 a.m. on May 25th, 2013, but before starting the 15-mile drive home. He took his usual route using exit 34 off of the Bluegrass Parkway. While rounding the bend, the officer noticed debris on the ramp. He blocked off the road to prevent other cars from passing until the road was clear. He flipped on the overhead lights and exited his cruiser. Jason reached down to gather the fallen limbs and clutched them to his chest. Before he reached the side of the road, a barrage of shots exploded from a shotgun barrel, slamming into his torso and arms. The swiftness and brutality of his attack left him no time to reach for his service pistol as he was shot over and over again. And apparently there was a gunman up on the hill. Here's a picture of the hill, uh, as well as some pictures from the scene where Jason was killed. Um, this had to have been an extremely brutal attack outside of him not being able to reach for his revolver and to pull that out to defend himself in any way. Um, after he was shot, it seems like he also uh, wasn't able to call for help. I'm pretty sure he would have had a... Um, a, a CB system that was also on his body. And apparently there was no calls that had gone in on off of that either. So uh, it seems like it was a fairly quick and brutal attack, unfortunately. 
Officer Andrew Riley, also of Bardstown Police Department, was one of the first to arrive on scene. His first thought was that Jason had been hit by a car. He realized the small pellets beside his friend's body were buckshot, not gravel. And one of the other things that's kind of interesting about this case is um, buckshot, you can't really trace back to a gun. It's not like when a bullet is fired from a gun and there's rifling marks on the bullet that could be matched back up to the barrel. Uh, when it comes to buckshot, you're not able to do that. So whoever was committing this crime was doing some very smart things. First of all, they staged this scene. Um, did they know that it was him in particular or were they just waiting for anyone to pull over and move those branches off the road? That is a big question in this case, but a lot of people seem to theorize this was a specific hit specifically trying to get him. If that's true, it would have had to have been someone that was following his actions close enough to know, uh, first of all, that he had a shift that day. Second of all, what time his shift would usually end so they could stage themselves in the right position. Third, they would have to know his usual route home. Uh, and was there any variations in that? Could it be that he might have come from the other freeway exit, which means that he would have completely missed all this? Um, there's a lot of questions in terms of the planning and staging of this and kind of how well it was done that leads some people even to believe that there might have been, if it wasn't an inside job, there might have been some information from inside that was given to someone to help enable this. But let's continue with uh, this article at Sword and Scale. In the days following the brutal murder of Officer Ellis, a full-scale investigation was launched involving all of the Bardstown Police Force and a portion of the Kentucky State Troopers. In the small town of, it's actually 14,000, murder was not a common occurrence. A thorough investigation of the crime scene and surrounding areas moved forward, but the only evidence police reported to the media was the discarded shotgun shells. Now, shells, I do believe there has been other cases where um, prints could be lifted off of shells. We have no information if anything like that is going on here. It's just the first thing that pops in my mind when I realized that the culprit at least left something behind. Um, I don't know if there was anything else left. Like I mentioned at the start of this video, very, very little physical evidence to talk about here. Um, Brain Scratcher Jay did mention the possibility that the uh, limbs that were left in the road might have not been from the actual area. It might have been brought there by the person that did this. Um, I've also seen some notes on some articles about this, that the limbs were actually cut, that they were actually sawed, that they could see at the ends of them, that they weren't limbs that had naturally broken off and fallen into the road. So um, in terms of physical evidence, I think that's about all that there is, but let's continue. Officer Ellis's personal life was torn apart, searching for a motive behind the killings. A local gang called the Bardstown Money Gang were examined closely. Officer Ellis had arrested at least three of its members, including the suspected ring leader. Yet again, no, spe no suspects were named. Uh, the ring leader was actually serving a 10-year sentence. He was questioned and he specifically said, I didn't do this and I know that no one in my gang did this because if they did, I would know about it. Uh, within the next few weeks, the Bardstown Police Department received threats that Officer Ellis was only the first victim and more members of the town's small police force would be targeted next. The FBI became involved and examined the document, although they believed it was not written by Jason Ellis's killer. On August 10th, 2013, just two months after Jason Ellis's death, a young man, Brant Shekels, age 24, is arrested for fighting at a local party. He alluded to the arresting officers that he was either involved in Officer Ellis's murder or knew who was responsible. Shekels was a known member of the Bardstown Money Gang. The mayor of Bardstown, William Shekels, is said to be Brant's uncle. Um, I don't know if that mayor is still in service there or not, and I haven't seen any other real developments kick out about that fact on this case. Despite his outburst and threats against the arresting officers, Shekels was not declared a suspect by the Kentucky State Troopers. Some people pointed out that it looked to be an inside job. Police Chief McCubbins had made a prior statement admitting that a degree of tactical precision was required to shoot Jason Ellis based on the bullet trajectory. Uh, whoever killed him had to be decently versed in firearms and possess limited sharps shooting skills. 
Um, from what I understand about buckshot in particular and the type of buckshot that was used here, it was usually used for um, small prey, for you know hunting rabbits or, or things of that size. So to consider that there was any considerable distance between the person that was actually doing the shooting and where Jason was, um, yeah, I would say they had to be a pretty good shot. And buckshot, from my understanding, is known to spray into a pattern. It's not like a bullet where you have a travel and a specific point of impact. So um, again, I, I think uh, the chief is making a very good point here. Early news reports on this case also mentioned the possibility that uh, police were considering that it's very likely there is more than one person involved here, but they haven't given us any real good details why they think that. For example, if they noticed that there was more than one trajectory of gunfire that was happening or something, or something along those lines. Other residents wondered why it happened on the one night his trusted canine partner, Figo, wasn't on patrol with him. The dog's absence was information only a limited number of people would have known and caused further unease throughout the town. Some even pointed out that since he was shot along his typical route home, it was a reasonable assumption that he was the intended target. Perhaps Jason Ellis was killed for revenge by someone he had previously arrested or one of their associates. Maybe the Bardstown money gang killed him for putting a dent into their drug trade or otherwise contracted out the hit to a third party. There was also the possibility that the killer or killers had the intention of killing whomever stopped, be it law enforcement or civilian. I do think that's a pretty important um, aspect to keep in mind. Um, perhaps this was going to happen to anyone that had stopped there to move those branches. I did see in some news reports that um, police found someone that supposedly drove around those right before Officer Ellis had pulled up there. I, I guess that person might have not been shot because they didn't stop specifically to move those branches. But uh, it could be that they were in a very risky situation even driving through that and just didn't know it. Um, I'm not sure. Figo, his canine partner, was retired from duty so he could spend time with the remaining members of the Ellis family. I've also seen other articles that the police department then brought on um, additional canine units in honor of Officer Ellis. Um, there was a lot of things done in his honor. The funeral uh, procession, apparently the, the, there was miles and miles of cars following each other to his funeral. There was a very touching moment. Um, Figo was actually at his funeral and they say that without any prompting at all, uh, this happened. Figo actually went up and put his paw on his partner's casket. Um, very, very touching. Uh, I really, I can't look at that picture without, without getting chills and, and feeling a little emotional. Um, just a tragedy that this had to happen in this way. Let's get some more details from WDRB.com. Officer Michael Medley was among the first to reach Ellis on that cool morning that still featured a very bright full moon that illuminated the dark roadway. Once again, if this was planned, this person was really doing some intense planning on this. Uh, if there was a bright full moon, it would be much easier for them to see their intended target. Medley and fellow officer Andrew Riley arrived at about the same time after hearing a passerby shout into Ellis's police radio that an officer was down. Of course, that is a bit of the tape that we heard at the start of this. Medley recalled returning to his beat about a week after Ellis was murdered. He and Ellis worked together on the same shift nearly every day. It was so hard to come back. You were constantly looking over your shoulder because you weren't sure if there was some sort of threat. That and Jason was no longer there. It's incredibly hard to move on because you don't know who is responsible and why. The off-ramp where Ellis was killed is covered in American flags and a cross. Here is a photo that you can see of it. Bearing the name and the badge number of the fallen officer across the front. There are teddy bears and baseballs too, a tribute to Ellis's time as a baseball player that had ultimately led him to playing three years with the Cincinnati Reds minor league team in Montana. More than 1,000 police officers from around the country honored the fallen officer during his burial at Highview Cemetery. In a heartbreaking moment during the ceremony, Ellis's canine Figo touched his casket. 
The pain felt by the officers left behind is something Bardstown Police Chief Rick McCubbin knows well. He too has suffered from sleepless nights and anxiety-filled days as he has tires tirelessly searched for Ellis's killer. To the person who knows something, I wish they would come forward. I'm not even talking to the person who pulled the trigger. I'm talking to the person who drove the car or the person who noticed that a loved one was missing that night and felt that something was odd. You hold the vital link to helping us solve this. We know that the person who pulled the trigger will not come forward. So now we must put some attention on the other people who know what happened that night. Really, really terrible. Um, very soon, uh, many different ways uh, Officer Ellis was being honored. Um, but this, I'm sure, would have been a huge joy for him to, to know in his life. Reds honors children of slain Kentucky officer Jason Ellis and other fallen officers before their game. Before the game, players and fans saluted members of local police and fire departments for the annual police and fire appreciation night at Great American Ballpark. As part of the tribute, the children of slain Bardstown police officer Jason Ellis were introduced as honorary captains of the game. Ellis's son, Parker, through the ceremonial first pitch. Uh, if I didn't mention before, he was a family man. He had two children. Uh, one of them actually suffers from Down syndrome. Uh, his wife has also put out a very emotional appeal on YouTube. I'll include that in the, in the uh, description box below so you can see that for yourself. Um, yeah, and he was also a coach, a little league coach, along with one of his fellow police officers. Um, just a man that was living his life and giving to the community in so many different ways. It's, uh, it's such a tragedy. Now we're moving to a little piece of news from this year. This was, as of only a few months ago, announced ex-troopers to investigate ambush killing of cop. Uh, two retired Kentucky state troopers have been hired to investigate the ambush and killing of Bardstown, Kentucky police officer Jason Ellis, as well as four other cases from the area that involved either murder, a suspicious death, or a presumed death. And this is where things started taking a little turn for me in terms of looking into this case. Uh, when you see a piece of news like this, um, it makes you wonder, okay, what's going on? Now we're talking about uh, several other cases. And for some reason, um, there's been a team assembled to look into all these cases and to see if they're connected in some way. A community has been rocked by these cases, says Lieutenant Michael Webb, a state police spokesman. Webb said police haven't ruled out the possibility that the cases might be connected. The deaths began with Ellis in May of 2013. Nearly a year later, the bodies of Kathy and Samantha Netherland were discovered inside their home near Bardstown in April of 2014. Um, I believe that Kathy is the mother. I believe that she was shot. Uh, Samantha, I think, is a 16-year-old daughter. And if I recall correctly, she was bludgeoned. Um, I don't know of any connectivity of them to Ellis directly, but you're talking about a relatively small community of, you know, 14,000 people. I think there's probably some potential. They knew each other in some regard, but I haven't seen uh, what that connection actually is. Uh, then Rogers, um, this is talking about Crystal Rogers, uh, who is now presumed dead, vanished in July of 2015. Her car was found on the Bluegrass Parkway, yes, the same stretch of road, uh, with a flat tire. Her purse and keys were inside the vehicle. And last November, that's just 2016, her 54-year-old father, uh, Ballard, was shot and killed near Bardstown during a hunting trip with his grandson. So um, very interesting. And when Brain Scratcher Jay uh, reached out to me initially talking about these cases, he mentioned that um, the connectivity between Crystal Rogers and her father being killed seems much more than coincidental. And we're going to get into some further information here where I think he's right. Basically, her father was pretty vocal about the fact that he would never stop looking for his daughter. Um, and he had spent the last uh, almost year and a half of his life doing exactly that. So could it be that he was getting too close to someone, needed to be silenced for some reason? Um, I'm really not sure. 
Okay, so back to is there a potential connection here? Uh, an article from WDRB.com. We're going to get some more detail. Uh, in a matter of months, Sherry Ballard lost her daughter and her husband. He lived every breathing moment trying to find our daughter, Sherry said of Tommy Ballard. Trust me, it's a murder investigation. It's not a death investigation. Someone murdered my husband on purpose that day. Of course, there's some question of was this really a murder versus was this some type of hunting accident? Um, I, I don't know. I would I would assume that if it was a hunting accident, they would probably have some contact with the person that was the shooter. Uh, hopefully, they would have realized they did something wrong and went and tried to help the person, but... Uh, I guess that it, things don't always go that way. Um, Sherry Ballard says Tommy told her that he was being followed. She says he even had a surveillance camera on his truck. That video is now in the hands of the Kentucky State Police. Uh, I have not heard if anything has come out of analysis on that video uh, or any other hard evidence about that case. Uh, once again, these cases, there's just there's not a lot of physical evidence that's being discussed or at least being released publicly. Um, I, I'm really not sure why why that's happening, but that's what's going on here. Another article at WDRB um, talks about the community's reaction to all this a little bit. Solve these murders, yard signs in Bardstown stand out in political season. So uh, back in November, while everyone else has, you know, Clinton and Trump signs in their yard in Bardstown, uh, frequently you will see these signs solve these murders. Um, a Bardstown resident, Imogene Morrow, said, even though it's election time, we haven't forgotten. Uh, she also hopes that it helps to battle a stigma that has taken over the small central Kentucky town. You want to commit murder? Come to Bardstown, she said. I don't like it, but that's a saying now. The signs show no matter how much time passes, this community has not stopped hurting. Uh, and in particular, when we're talking about these four cases that might or might not be connected, if you look at the time frame of those cases, uh, yeah, I would I would say that the community is probably going to be feeling that. I mean, you're basically going a year and you have another murder case and a year and another murder case and none of them are, are being solved. Um, I, I definitely get the frustration that the citizens are going through there. Uh, now we're going to dive just a little bit into uh, the Crystal Rogers um, story, and I'm only doing this because there's this thread that might tie back to Jason Ellis now that we know that investigators are kind of looking in this direction and potentially could feed into that theory that maybe there was an inside job or some element of inside information at work here. Um, this article is titled Crime Involving Crystal Rogers Believed to Have Happened at Hauk Farm. Rogers disappeared on July 3rd, 2015. The 35-year-old mother of five's car was found on the Bluegrass Parkway with her purse, phone, and keys still inside. Months later, the Nelson County Sheriff's Office named Rogers' longtime boyfriend, Brooks Hauk, the only suspect in her disappearance, also saying Rogers was likely dead. Now, why does any of that matter? Well, the police force that Officer Ellis worked for uh, is only about 27 people big. And one of those other 27 people is not Brooks Hauk, but it's his brother. Uh, and we're going to find some more information about how his brother responded to uh, some of these allegations that his brother is involved in. As a matter of fact, let's get to it real quick. Uh, from news.com.au, cop Nick Hauk fired for warning suspect brother Brooks Hauk over missing woman Crystal Rogers. Nick Hauk, the suspect's brother, has been fired after he allegedly warned his sibling that police were planning on questioning him and to keep quiet. Nick Hauk failed a lie detector test when asked questions about Rogers. As a matter of fact, you can see the results of that lie detector test where the um, technician is speaking with him 
about the results of that test. Uh, you can find those videos on YouTube. So just look up uh, Nick Houck and there's tons of videos uh, of investigators talking to him, of the lie detector guy talking to him, press conferences that have to do with him. Um, there's a lot of media around this guy. There's other talk about potentially um, blood being found in the trunk of his cruiser. Um, there's some things that really make it look like he might have been more than involved in just this manner of tipping off his brother. But to date, uh, yes, he was fired, but that was for the specific act of making that phone call. Apparently he called his brother when his brother was already being questioned by sheriffs. So the sheriffs were there to witness the actual phone call. Uh, Nick, of course, swears he had nothing to do with Crystal's disappearance, but the lie detector results will certainly make you think twice about that. And if you watch his reactions that happened in that whole conversation, um, pretty suspect. It's pretty suspect. It's like a 45 minute video. I watched it from beginning to end. I did not have the strongest feeling about this man and certainly not his innocence after reviewing that. Um, but let's continue um, taking a look at just some crime statistics. I was trying to find out, you know, when you're talking about uh, a community of only 14,000 people, how often are there homicides even there? Now, um, Brain Scratcher Jay had told me that uh, at the information he looked into, it looked like there was several years where there were no homicides at all. And that would probably be expected when you have a community that small. I did find data that also backs that, but unfortunately it also had no homicides listed for the recent years. So I can't really trust that data. I think something's going on in the reporting there. I don't know why those homicides aren't being reported in that national data, but I could not find a good source to try to find that. Uh, what I did find is this um, website, pointtopointhomes.com, that gives you all kinds of information, not just about crime. It's basically, if you're thinking about moving to a community, you can come here and check it out. And it's looking specifically at Nelson County. Um, and in that data you're seeing that compared to the national averages for all these categories, uh, you know, total crime risk, it's only at 44% of the national average. Personal crime risk, it's only a 32. Rape risk is really low at 15. Robbery is even lower. Assault is pretty low. But look at the discrepancy between what is typically considered violent attacks, rape, assault. Uh, these are super, super low, but murder just pops over the national average. As a matter of fact, it's the only category that goes up over the national average. Um, I would think that that is an anomaly. Something strange is going on here when you have other violent crimes so low, but for some reason, murder pops the chart like that. That uh, having done a lot of previous work with uh, information management, something about this looks really, really wrong to me. Like I mentioned, some of the other data that I looked into, um, I was kind of unsure of, so I'm not sure if the reporting is really tight on this type of information. Um, you have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt, but considering how natural the rest of these results look, that murder risk number looks very, very strange to me. Bardstown leadership shakeup worries mother in high profile case. Uh, this is news from just this month, July of 2017. And I was really surprised to hear this, especially when you're considering, is there something going on in this relatively small police department of 27 people? Could someone be leaking information to someone else that helped them enable uh, the death of Officer Ellis? What's going on around all this? Well, for the third time in the past year, the city of Bardstown has a new police chief. For the third time in a year? Uh, quote, maybe they're trying to take the steps in the right direction to clean this town up, said Sherry Ballard, Crystal Rogers' mother. I think they are dysfunctional. There are so many cases that are unsolved, Ballard said. Now, another shakeup and another chief of police in Bardstown, a fourth of the police department, eight officers, have left since the beginning of the year. Sherry, like so many others in Bardstown, just want to know what the future holds. 
something's going on there. And um, if you look into more articles about this, uh, the police chief that is going out is saying that there was nothing that he could have done about these eight officers that left. They were essentially looking into other areas. They found better paying jobs. Um, apparently to be a cop in Bardstown is not the highest paying position. Um, but when you're talking about you've rolled over the management three times, uh, I think that's going to cause some people to leave their job anyway. People don't like um, having that feeling of inconsistencies, particularly when your boss is getting changed three times out in a year. It probably doesn't feel like a very stable department. But what's causing that to happen? Um, there are interviews with the recent police chief that left. He really has no reasonable explanation. He was terminated. He said the conversation took about five minutes. Um, when you look into his history, if anyone is going to clean up a town, I would think that it would be someone from somewhere else. And he definitely had that type of experience and history. The person that has been put into the, uh, at least the interim chief, which just happened this week, uh, is kind of one of the one of the old boys, someone that actually worked within the department. The city of Bardstown has a new interim police chief. Charles Marksbury was named to the position on Friday. He had served for 22 years before retiring in 2011. Uh, he came back after that as an evidence technician. And here you can see that there is a social media post welcoming him back as the chief of police. Is that good or bad for this situation? I don't know. Um, my personal feeling on things like this, I think I kind of gave it to you already, but just to be really, really clear, if you feel like you have corruption going on within a small organization, bring in fresh people. Bring in people that you know can't be touched by that corruption. Uh, what we're seeing here is someone that worked in that department. Um, I, I, I don't know. He could be a good guy. He could be absolutely clean. I'm not saying that this whole department is dirty. Far from it. Um, I'm just saying if you want to be absolutely sure that you're removing bad culture, um, trying to really change and shake things up, I don't know that this is necessarily how you do it. But um, it just makes me wonder what the heck happened to Officer Ellis um, with all this shakeup that's going on. Is this a result? Is this because of the investigations not going well? Is this because of the community not feeling safe? What happened on this parkway? Um, could it have been someone within the police department that staged this and make this happen? Um, I think we have to consider it. I don't think that the we should limit our view to that. Um, you know, another thing I was wondering was where would the person where would the person have parked? Um, and if if you can see here. I don't know if this is a ride share area or what, but there's this area where you could very easily park your vehicle, um, come out over on this side of the hill and stage whatever you are going to do. Um, I'm not positive if this is the right direction. I haven't found any articles that are very clear about which exit he took, if it was this one or if it was this one down here. Uh, if it is this one down here, I'm really uncertain where the person would have parked unless they might have left their car uh, at some point in the emergency lane up around here. I don't know. But this side looks like um, it just it looks like where someone could have easily stashed their car, maybe even if they came to this side to commit the crime. But I don't think you're going to lug a shotgun all the way back across this road and risk being seen. I, I really don't know. And some very sad news, uh, just in June of 2017, Bardstown mourns the loss of Figo, the canine of fallen officer Jason Ellis. Figo and Jason Ellis are linked by their service, but also by a moment that took everyone's breath away when Figo pawed at the casket of his fallen partner. Figo passed away in his sleep just days before the fourth year marking Ellis's murder. Uh, Figo's urn will be attached to Ellis's grave site. The family tried to raise some money. They originally wanted Figo buried um, with Officer Ellis, but the cemetery would not allow a pet to be buried there. So I think they worked out something very smart where they're going to have Figo's urn be part of the grave site. I know this has been a windy one, guys, but ultimately... It's about Officer Jason Ellis. What happened to him? How is that person going to be caught? Um, I really hope that the police department, maybe under this new leadership, this new management, 
will possibly release some more information to the public that could jostle the memories of some of the local citizens, some people that might know something out there. There's just so few details about this case. It's really, really hard to um, to even know which direction to look. And I'm sure the public feels the same way. Uh, is, is the police department doing everything it can to solve this case? If we look at the history of police departments in terms of officer-related fatalities, I would have to say yes. They have a very strong trend of solving these types of cases. So in my heart, I do hope that this case eventually gets solved. I hope that all this management shakeup and, you know, we do have one officer that was tipping off his brother. I hope that these are isolated incidents and not signs of some larger corruption that was going on in this department that might have even led to what happened to Officer Ellis. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that we have to consider around that. But unfortunately, this is the way that the media is looking today. And that's all I can really say about this episode of Brain Scratch. I'm just trying to give you guys an overview of the high points of this story and where they're at today. There could be factors that we don't know about. There could be other gangs. There could be some other guy that Officer Ellis took down that you know was released or tipped off one of his friends to do something. There's a lot of other aspects that could be going on here. So I, I wanted to look at this fairly. I wanted to report was in the media to all of you and give you kind of my thoughts on it. But I have to tell you at this at the end of this episode, I feel very very lost. I feel. Um, like there's just not enough detailed information out there for us to really understand what's going on with this case. I just hope that that someone out there that does have that information will do the right thing and put it in the hands of the people that can act on it and help make your community safer. Ultimately, you got 14,000 people that aren't sure what's going on with their police department at this point. You've got numerous unsolved cases. You have an officer that is definitely doing some bad things uh, in terms of protecting his brother, might have done even worse than that, but he's still walking the streets for some reason. I don't know. This there's there's a lot of weird stuff going on in this area. Does it all tie back to Officer Ellis or not? That's where I turn it over to you guys. Let's talk about this in the comments below. And once again, I ask we please be respectful. Um, this is this is real life. This is a real person. This is a guy that was doing a lot for his community uh, in several different ways, raising a family, um, and unfortunately, his life was cut far far. Um, too short. And it's really, it, should, it just shouldn't have happened like this. It really shouldn't have. To Officer Ellis's friends and family, and I have a feeling there's a lot of you out there, um, all of my deepest condolences. I wish you all peace and healing and um, that you are able to hold on to those strong memories and lessons that you had from having this man in your life. And I'm very, very sorry that he was taking, taken from you. Thank you, everyone. I will see you here back on Monday on the Lord Narts channel. <laughs>